Hello and welcome everybody, this is Grandmaster Sam Shankland, and today I'd like to continue my series on the Bishop Against the Knight. So in our first video we saw a really classical and well-known game between Fischer and Petrosian. And here I'd like to move on to a much less well-known game, in fact it wasn't even a rated game, it was a rapid game in the US Chess League between Alejandro Ramirez and Joel Benjamin. But while this game was faster, and in between weaker players, obviously, than two world championship candidates, and on the internet and all that, and not very well known. I think it was nonetheless an extremely good example of the power of the bishop when playing on an open board, and in particular, the power of the bishop over the knight when playing with passed pawns on opposite sides of the board. So at this point, we have a pretty typical exchange Spanish endgame. It looks like White's gotten a slightly better version of it than normal because he's been able to exchange some pieces. Black doesn't have the bishop pair anymore while he still has a somewhat crippled pawn structure. But here Alejandro had a choice to make. Right now, he can leave Black with the same kind of crippled pawn structure. Not a huge deficit, but at least something. Or he has the option to grab the bishop pair right now. So I'd like to give everyone a moment to think and uh, decide what they'd like to play. If you need more time, please pause your videos, but I'm going to keep on going. So Alejandro took on d6. I don't think this was the only decent move, but uh, for our purposes, it's the most important one to look at. Now, there's no doubt this is somewhat of a concession because it allows Black to straighten out his pawns, but very soon we're going to see how the bishops are able to work. So White finds a very strong move here, bishop b6. This forces rook d7. And now this bishop on b6 is really, really annoying, and Black has a very hard time getting rid of it. He'd like to play a move like knight d7 at some point to attack it, but the rook is occupying that square. You could say, well, why not just move the rook? But as we'll soon see, white prevents this from happening. Rook fd1. Now, if given a couple moves, white could play something like rook d2 and rook ad1, this pawn on d6 is going to start to feel very uncomfortable very fast. So it's not surprising at all that Benjamin chose to play g6 with the idea to play f5. Once black is able to play f5, he will have broken down this pawn on a4, and then he can play d5 to prevent the pawn on d6 from becoming too much of a weakness. Still, after king f2, f5, e takes f5, g takes f5, here we have the exact kind of situation I was speaking about before. At this point, we have a position where we have an open board, a bishop against the knight, and most importantly, we have uh, different pawn structures, so that white has a majority on the king side and black has a queen side center majority. This will mean that Ultimately, when both sides make past pawns, the bishop will prove superior. So white played rook a4. This is a multi-purpose move. I guess really it's a single purpose. The rook wants to attack weak pawns, but it has plenty of options on which weak pawns to go after. White could play rook f4, he could play rook h4 to h5, or he could play rook a to d4. All of these are good ways to target weak pawns. So black played rook e6, white played rook a d4, and d5. And so here I'd like everyone to pause their videos and come up with a move for white. What should white play in this position? Okay, if you want more time, please keep your videos paused. Hopefully you guys will recall that at the beginning of my first lecture, one of the uh, things I said about the bishop is that it's really happy on an open board and it wants to open some lines. So here I very much like Ramirez's move, which is c4. This forces open some lines and the bishop will feel very comfortable on an open board. Black is not really able to do anything except for d takes c4, just because c takes d5 is a big threat. If black tries to defend with rook e d6, white can play bishop c5 and expel this rook and take on d5 next move. So black really has to take on c4. So b takes c4, rook takes d4, rook takes d4. Now I would not advise black to blunder into rook d8 mate, so it's not surprising that he played uh, knight d7, kicking this bishop away, and after bishop a5, b6. The bishop's gone forever. Black no longer has to worry about checkmate. But still, after bishop c3, now we're seeing where this bishop will be perfect. On this very long diagonal here, that will control all the key squares as black's pawns start running forwards. These bishops will control that. While at the same time, white's pawn running forward will have a much easier time. So knight c5. And now Alejandro's next move, g4, was not approved by the computer. All the engines seem to think this wasn't very strong. Probably the computers are right, but for the purposes of our lecture, I don't really take issue with it. I think it's a pretty decent idea, and I think it led to an especially instructive finish, so I don't really have much complaint. The computers were much happier trying to leave black with the kingside pawn weaknesses and attack them. I think they wanted to play moves like rook h4 here or something, but 
G4 is a very human move, and I think a very decent one. So F takes G4, Rook takes G4, Knight A4. And now the next move again wasn't computer approved, but I like it, which is Bishop G7. And this is just sort of ultimate bishop versus knight at its simplest and most effective. If you look at this bishop on g7, it's controlling squares all the way back towards b2, which includes everything black wants to do. He wants to take the pawn on b2 with the knight, he wants to advance b5 and then b4 and c5, c4 and c3. This bishop is going to be very good at blocking those pawns from being especially effective. And finally, if you look at this white pawn on um, f3, that's white's pass pawn. It wants to run straight down the board. And this bishop is controlling the key f6 and f8 squares, which will both be critical in this pawn's journey towards becoming a new queen. So black tried b5. I can't blame him. It's quite simple. He wants to get his pawns going. Takes, takes, f4. And here black blundered the game away in one move. I think his position is quite difficult anyway. f5 is a serious threat, and it's not easy at all to stop. Black could try something like king d7 to meet f5 with a rook move, I don't know, say rook d6, f5, and now king e6, with the intention of playing king f7 and stopping this pawn in its tracks. But still, after something like rook e4 check and rook e7, I would be very worried with black that this pawn might just crash straight through and leave me behind. But, um, Benjamin played rook g6, which is a very natural move, at least to the human eye, because after rook takes g6, h takes g6, now this pawn on f4 cannot advance uh, because the pawn on g6 controls that square. So these pawns are kept at bay, uh, and ideally black would like to bring his king into play. But this brings me to another point, which really is an overarching point in all of chess. Uh, I think it has nothing really to do with the bishop pair. Although, of course, the bishop pair is the scope of this video. This is a point that I think could be driven home in literally any video about chess, which is that if there is something that you really would like to do, and your opponent is seemingly stopping you from doing it, the first question you should always ask yourself is what happens if I just do what I want to do anyway and test my opponent's defenses? And here we quickly see that after f5, white actually can get away with this move since g takes f5 is well met by h4, and black's going to have a very hard time stopping this pawn. So he did his best with king d7 h5, knight c5. And here black's point is that after h6, it looks like this pawn is just crashing straight through, but after knight e4 check, the knight can get back to g5 and then stop me. But unfortunately for black, this isn't enough, because after king e3, if black were to play knight g5 here, king f4, now this knight has to move again because it's under attack. If knight e6 check, king takes f5, and black is unable to stop this pawn from crashing through. Similarly, if knight h7 takes, white's next move is going to be king g6, and this knight on h7 is just a really sorry piece. It's not helping the pawns on the queen side advance at all. It's barely even helping stop the king side pawn because uh, it's just going to get taken. Another key note is that knights against rook pawns are just not good for the knights. But if you imagine this position here, forgetting the fact that the king would be hanging, imagine if black had a bishop on h7. White would not win this game. He can't get rid of that bishop, and that bishop is reasonably effective at controlling both sides of the board. That's the whole point of this knight being really inferior to the bishop when you have an open board and pass pawns on both sides. The bishop on g7 versus the knight on h7 is just a joke. So, instead uh, of knight g5, black tried knight d6, and after h7, knight f7, yeah, white could uh, queen his pawn here, but after takes, takes, and c5... It's not immediately clear if white's going to win the game because he only has one pawn left and black is reasonably active. And after something like king f4, king e6, at every juncture, white's going to have to calculate what happens if black simply gives this pawn away, runs the king into b3, and tries to get b4, c4, and c3 in, which should hold the game. So h8 queen, it's funny, but actually this pawn on h7 is worth a lot more than that knight. So white played a much more patient and a much stronger move with king to f4. Now, if black were to start running his queenside pawns, we're seeing just the, the perfect classical example after king takes f5 and say c4, king g6 attacking the knight, king f6, and say bishop c3. Here black's pawns are literally just stopped in their tracks, they're going absolutely nowhere, and the knight, while it's stopping h8 queen for the moment, I mean, it's possible, like, he, black should always have to check this move at every single juncture if it works, 
it's not actually doing anything else. And it can't even like move back and forth to waste time and lose a tempo for Zoot Swarm. For instance, after something like king to e8, king to f6, here, bishop b4 check, and king g7. If black could pass here, I think he'd probably still be losing. I mean, there's some lines to calculate. But as is, this knight on f7 is unable to just move back and forth and lose a tempo. So here, white actually just queens his pawn next move because black is in zoot swung directly, while a bishop could have moved back and forth forever. So, instead of c5, black tried king e6, which makes a lot of sense because he wants to save the pawn on f5. But here white has a very strong and very important move. Let's see if you guys can figure out what it is. I'll give you a moment to pause your videos. Alright, if you want more time, please keep your videos paused. I think white has more than one winning move here, but I really like the move played in the game. And that is b4. It's very simple, white is blocking the pawns on the queen side from advancing, and here we're seeing, just like the previous example, black is actually in zoot swarm. If black could just stay pass here and sit in this position for the rest of the game, at least until white played h8 queen and black could play knight takes h8, it's, there's some calculation to be done, but my guess is it would be a draw. As is, black has to move right now, and he's got to make some kind of concession, because this knight is just so incapable of losing a tempo, it's fighting against the rook pawn, it's fighting against this bishop that's just dominating it. The knight is almost useless, it just, it feels like a terrible piece. Black would love to just lose it for the pawn on h7, but he can't, even though it controls the queening square. So, he tried c5 just to try to make some kind of mess, I'm sure at this point Benjamin realized that he was completely lost, but, uh, there's nothing really else to do. For instance, if black were to try king e7 after king takes f5, he's now in the same dilemma. He's got to move again. And if he tries to run after these pawns, king takes f5, king c4, the problem is after something like king f6, that this knight's just going to be taken. It's like the white king just goes jump, 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 in, gobble, and take the knight, and then the next thing you know, the pawn is queening. So black tried c5, which was maybe just a last resort in a lost position. I mean, I think white is winning every which way. But I quite like the finish of this game because I think it's very illustrative. So b takes c5, b4, and black is trying to get this b pawn going. At this point, pawns are equal. Both sides have two passed pawns, and even this b pawn is going to get to b3. It's going to be pretty close to queening, just like the h7 pawn is. But uh, after c6, b3, c7, king d7, king takes f5, king takes c7. Here we have the most classic possible case of a bishop dominating a knight when you have pawns on both sides of the board and an open board and a race. Here, this pawn on b3, okay, it's two squares away from queening, while the pawn on h7 is one square away from queening, so yeah, technically uh, it's faster for the white pawn anyway. This bishop on uh, g7 is performing such an awesome role. It's controlling the queening square, which means that black can't block it on the queening square when the knight is attacked. It's controlling any checking squares, so... For instance, king g6, black would like to start giving some checks to give annoyance, but knight e5 check, which would be the checking square, is under control. It can't go there. And finally, it's stopping this pawn all the way on the other side of the board from going to b2 and then b1 because it controls a square en route to black making a new queen. Black could even have this pawn on a2 instead of b3 and have it just one square away from queening, and still this bishop on g7 would just perform every single purpose in the book, and that's why it's so much better than the knight. And now here, white just has to be a little bit careful. All he has to do is attack the knight in an effective way, and the game ends. King e6 is not to be recommended on account of knight g5 check, and the pawn will be lost. Similarly, king f6 would be a mistake, because now this all-important diagonal to b2 has been blocked, and here black is able to play b2, and after takes queens and queens, we have a technically drawn endgame. White is unable to win with the queen and bishop against a king, and in fact, it's probably just a direct perpetual check. But... Alejandro found one more good move to finish off the game with king g6. This attacks the black knight, and then no matter what black does, he cannot stop the pawn from queening. If the knight moves, the pawn queens, and the black king can't defend the knight. I'm thinking, though, even if the black king could defend the knight, let me just try something like king g4, king d7, king h5 here. Something like this, I think even this is probably still winning, just because black will find himself in zoot swarm. For instance, let's say king e6. After bishop f6 here, black has 
he's just done. He needs to move the knight or the pawn once he moves the pawn. He's, once If he plays b2, he loses the pawn. We'll have the same dude swung later. And if he moves the knight, the pawn queens. Perhaps king e8 would be more resilient, but still after a simple bishop move and say king f8, bishop f6. Once again, black is in zoot swung. He can't move the knight. He can't move the pawn. And if he moves the king after king g7, the white pawn queens. And we see this very classical domination of the bishop against the knight because the bishop is supporting both sides of the board while the knight can only support one. So uh, this was another clear case of the bishop just showing its dominance, but rest assured we'll look at some situations where the knight turns out to be superior as well. So this was the second video in the series, and until the third one, uh, this is Sam Shanklin, and thank you for watching.